I just think it's the person, not the style. I, I think you can take somebody out of one style. Good morning, or afternoon, evening, whenever you're listening, welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and it's time for episode 214. Today, I'm speaking with Grandmaster David Oliver, a Taekwondo practitioner, instructor, former national team coach, and organization chairman from the United Kingdom. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring year, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on traditional martial arts twice each week. Welcome. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning fans, and welcome to all you new listeners. Are you following our YouTube channel? We release every episode on YouTube, and it's a great way to set up a playlist of the episodes if you want some motivating martial arts background during work or some other project. We have other videos over there, of course, and it looks like we'll be adding more quite soon. Check us out at youtube.com slash whistlekick. There are times in life where success just doesn't seem possible. At a listener's suggestion, I reached out to Grandmaster David Oliver and invited him to come on the show. He accepted, but the hurdles we jumped through to make this episode happen were unlike anything I've experienced in the history of this show. From various technical issues to scheduling challenges, it seemed, honestly, that some greater force was trying to keep me from talking with him. Fortunately, for me, for the show, for you all, Grandmaster Oliver was incredibly accommodating, and we were able to work things out. In the end, the episode came out great. This is a man with more than 50 years in Taekwondo, someone who actually knew General Choi. He's dedicated his life to martial arts, and now the organization he oversees has more than 25,000 members. It was an honor to speak with him, and I hope you take as much wisdom from our conversation as I did. Let's welcome him. Grandmaster Oliver, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hi, thank you. Well, thank glad you. Glad to be here. Well, I'm, I'm glad to have you here. I appreciate your patience with calendar schedules across time zones and technical difficulties and all that. But finally, we're here. I know I've, I've had several folks from, from the UK reach out once they heard that we were going to be talking to you, asking when it was going to happen. And now it's happening. And of course, we'll air it as soon as we can. Share your thoughts with the world. Uh Okay, that's fine. We start in a, in a pretty rudimentary way, but I, I think it's really important, so I, I don't want to deviate from that. How did you start as a martial artist? Um, I started uh, in 19... Um, uh, I was, well, I'll was go back. I, was, I started in Australia uh, in 1969. Um, I was living over there in Perth. I'd emigrated there. And um, I was working with a guy on a building site. I was a bricklayer. <clears throat> and um, we actually went out drinking one night, and he got in a bit of a row. And um, he, uh, we had a confrontation with someone, and uh, he kicked this guy. And I'd never seen anybody do that kind of thing before. Um, and uh, I asked him what it was, and he said, oh, I do karate, and he did water with karate. And, because it was at uh, that time we were just working together and there was no real anything else to do, I started training with him, and that's how I got started. And um, and then when I came back to England, uh, I looked at a couple of uh, karate clubs, but they weren't particularly impressive. And then I seen a demonstration of taekwondo uh, that impressed me, and so I started then, and that was 1970. Okay. So when you when you started karate in Australia. Did you know anything about karate at the time? No, not, nothing whatsoever. I had no knowledge of it whatsoever. I boxed quite a lot when I was young. Uh, in schoolboy boxing, I boxed at a local amateur boxing club. But I'd never really heard of karate. I knew absolutely nothing about it at all. I'd never even seen it. So your interest in participating was because someone you knew was doing it. Maybe you, you were impressed at, at what had happened with with that that fight, yeah, if you I'll, want to call I'll, it that, yeah, yeah. I, I was impressed with the fact that he could use it self defense wise to, uh, you know, uh, defend himself. Yeah, that's that's what impressed me, and I thought, oh, I wouldn't mind being able to do that. So uh, we got talking, and uh, that, like I said, we were working together on building sites at the time, and uh, uh, we used to go out a lot drinking. Unfortunately, at that time, uh, because I was away from home, and, uh, and so I just thought. Oh, I was bored, so I thought I'd take this up. I like it. And that's how I got started. 
and clearly something about it resonated for you. You you were interested enough that you were continuing to pursue it, and then interested in pursuing something similar but different. What was yeah, it well, you found uh, in martial uh, arts? Well, I got I, I started reading books about it, uh, Masuyama's book and things like that, and old karate books. Uh, not Taekwondo this time. I didn't know nothing about that. Um, so I, I was reading about that and looking at it, and I got more and more deeply, deeply interested in it. And uh, and then when I said Taekwondo, I started. Uh, I seen guys jumping up, breaking boards, breaking bricks, and sparring. And then I got into it, uh, and and I was like hooked. I started training. When I did start training, I was training every day, not missing. What was it about that demonstration that that kind of pulled you away, or or is that a good way to describe it? Yeah, it, it, it was the actually I think the power um, because uh, although I'd seen some karate and I'd read books and seen things like that, but these guys were jumping over the backs of six people and breaking wood and they broke bricks and and they're sparring. It was very powerful and. Uh, it was a higher standard than 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 what at that point and than what I'd seen in the in the karate at that point. Here on the show, we like to tell a lot of stories, and anyone that has trained in multiple styles across multiple continents, I, I'm sure, has quite a few stories. Would you tell us your favorite martial arts story? <laughs> yeah, well, I've got I've got a lot, but. Um... I want. I think the one I'd uh, tell the most is a kind of a disaster story. Um, I was a national team coach, and um, we went travelled to uh, Naples in Italy uh, for the European Championships, and uh, we'd been insured by the chief instructor and uh, the treasurer that everything was looked after uh, for us. So we flew out, and then when we got to Naples, we were supposed to be picked up in a coach and taken to the hotel but when we got off the plane there was absolutely no one there whatsoever so luckily uh, the other guy who was managing the team with me he had the name of the hotel so we had to get the boys and jump into taxis and get to the hotel when we got to the hotel we were informed there's no rooms booked here for you uh, we know nothing about it so we talked to the manager they did get some rooms available and we had to use our own credit card and the next morning, we were told again that we'd be picked up and taken to the venue. Uh, but again, nothing materialized. Uh, so we had to catch a, a bus and a train to get to the, the venue, uh, which was, it took us about an hour. Then when we got to the venue, they wouldn't let us in because they said that the entry fees had not been paid. Uh, so after a lot of arguing, they went inside, uh, got out the chief instructor. Uh, he came in and then he got us into the venue. And then the, the competition started, and when it came to the, one of the finals, one of our guys uh, called Kenny Walton, he for a hometown favourite, uh, Italian guy, and uh, he beat him. And the Italian got very emotional, threw himself on the floor, and the referee at the time was a Greek, a uh, big guy, six foot six, called Dimitri. And someone came out of the crowd with a bottle and attacked him. So obviously it all kicked off. There was like a riot in, in the stadium and they had to bring in the riot police and calm it all down. So that that, that was the end of that bit. But then uh, General Choi, who was there at the time, he asked me to pick a European select team to fight a North Korean demonstration team. It was the first time they'd been out of North Korea. And uh, they had a five-man team, so we put five guys to spar against them, five breaks and the team pattern. Well, we won all five spars, and we won all five breaks. And during one of the breaks, uh, when the technique was a 360 jumping back kick, where the guy stood on the chair, and North Korean guy jumped up, missed the boards, kicked the guy low, knocked him off the chair. Uh, anyway, that we carried on. And then we did the pattern. Obviously, they'd been practicing the, uh, the pattern for months, because they were all together, and uh, we hadn't. So at the end, they announced it, and General Choi said that the whole thing was a draw because the, the, the sparring and the breaking was not as important as uh, as the pattern. 
And I think that was just about the end of it for me. I thought, well, that's ridiculous, but there you go. So that's about the most thing I remember about tournaments, and I've been to many, many over the years. Uh, but that one stands out more than any other. Mm. Well, there, there's a lot there, and certainly uh, as, <laughs> as one of the tenets of Taekwondo, perseverance comes to mind, <laughs> first off. Uh, <laughs> I, I know, yeah. I'm I'm curious yeah. about it, what, what General Choi said. Do you, do you think he truly, as a Taekwondo practitioner currently, my, myself, this... You know, that statement that the forms were more important seems to be counter to what I've always been taught within Taekwondo. So I'm wondering, do you think he, he only said that for the benefit of the team, or was that something he believed? Oh, I think he believed. I think he believed it. Um, I've met him on many occasions. Uh, and I think he believed that. I don't think he was really interested in the... Um, the competitive side that much, not the sparring side anyway, in particular. Uh, and nor was the chief instructor who we had at the time. Uh, he, he was in the uh, uh, He was one of the pioneers. Uh, mm. He wasn't interested in it either. Um, so I think that was that was the big problem there. Whereas I was the opposite. Uh, I was very competition oriented, and, and so was our team. So. Uh, I think that's uh, that he meant it at the time, you know. And I was also, of course, because North Korean, the first time out of North Korea, um, I suppose they lost a bit of face, really. Oh. Oh, that, that's interesting, yeah. and, and I don't know if you've. I mean, you've certainly were were around for more of Taekwondo's history than than I have been, but I've read what I can in yeah. uh, Alex Gillis's book. Yeah. I don't know if that's something that you've yeah, you've read it, through. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, a I book I, f- I find Very fascinating, simple. and if if I may ask, as someone who lived part of that history, what do you think of that book? Oh, I love that book. I think it's absolutely spot on. I think he got it right. That's one of the few books I've ever read. I think that really tells the truth uh, about Taekwondo and its history, um, because a, a, a lot of it has been changed around. There's a lot of people. Who, tell a different side of the story but I, I think it's a, a really good book I've met Alex Gillis and uh, I, I think uh, it's such a very honest straightforward book which a lot of people wouldn't want to write but he, he had the, the guts if you like to write it down Guts is a good way to put it Yeah, that's, and and listeners yeah. long time listeners to the show know that that book comes up from time to time because it is such a different book you know there really to my knowledge mm-hmm. isn't another martial arts book that takes that same style to to any other any other yeah. direction so yeah it's, it's, you know, it's an outstanding book I think mm. and something I always tell people to read uh, sometimes I go to meetings with people who don't understand Taekwondo but are involved in sports councils and things like that and to try and explain to them there's two styles of Taekwondo is very difficult when they don't understand it so I just told him to read that book, and I think that does the job. It, it certainly does illustrate a lot of the differences, without, without a doubt. Yeah, definitely. Outside of martial arts, are, are there things that you're passionate about? Any hobbies? Um, I'm a big soccer fan. Uh, I'm a season ticket holder with a Premier League football team called West Bromwich Albion. Um, I'm a big dog lover. Uh, I've got two American bulldogs, um, which uh, I look after a lot. And so those are the things. And But mainly, um, uh, my passion is really still taekwondo and, and martial arts and, and all styles of it. I like to see different people and to watch people. It's, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's about it. And, and family, really, um, going away with my grandchildren and things like that. Uh, enjoying holidays. Uh, uh, in fact, I'm, I'm coming out to Tampa, Florida, in two weeks' time, actually, to a tournament down there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see, which, which one is that? I'm trying to run through the calendar in my head. It's with, it's with Scott McNeely is running it in okay. Tampa. I think it's the 22nd, 23rd of, uh, of uh, July. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's a, there are quite a few that go on down that, that way. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Interesting. Now, when you say that you are passionate about martial arts and not just Taekwondo, what do you mean by yeah. that? 
Well, because um, I, I think sometimes people think, you, you know, Taekwondo people at times think there's nothing else but Taekwondo. Uh, and uh, I know that there's some absolutely excellent karate people and, and other styles as well. But um, because I, when I started, I read a lot of karate books and the karate. And at that time, Great Britain had a very, very um, big and good karate community. Um, they was well in advance of Taekwondo. You know, they're well in advance. They've been doing it a long time here. And they had a very good team and very good competitors. And they all used to compete every year, regardless of style, uh, in London once a year. And I always used to go down and watch it. And I've made some very good friends who do uh, karate and other styles. And uh, I just think it's the person, not the style. I, I think you could take somebody out of one style who's good at it and put him in another, and he would have been good in that. So uh, I'm not blinkered about Taekwondo. Uh, you know, I think um, I think a lot of Taekwondo people are. And um, I find a lot of the karate people are not so much. And uh, 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 The other thing I find about it is uh, a lot of Taekwondo people are very grade-orientated. Uh, you know, whereas in this country, the, a lot of the high-grade karate people aren't. What do you think creates that culture? I don't know. It just seems to have gone mad with people, well, people being, you know, masters, grandmasters. Uh, and some of them have not really trained that long at all. Um, but I think the culture has, has come, it's got worse since, you know, you've now got five ITFs, uh, which we just now, but I know the same thing happens in WTF as well. Um, and I, I think uh, the coaches had to come from the top, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and people now just seem to think, you know, oh, I'm, I'm not the grandmaster or a master or whatever. And it seems that they're obsessed with it instead of thinking about training, what they can put back into it. And because if I, if I remember correctly, you have quite a few schools that, that look to you. Am I remembering that? Yeah, in, in, in my organisation, yeah, no, not my organisation, the TAGB. Yeah, we have got six hundred schools. Okay. We've got twenty five thousand members. Okay, it's so a, it's the largest tech one. It's the largest group in Europe. It, it is a large organisation, regardless of where we're talking about. I mean, that, that just to yeah, to it, oversee it, it, that yeah. much. Have you? Is, is there an effort you've made, or, or or things that you've set down to your schools to try and? combat that? Because I'm, what I'm hearing in your words is that it's something that you disapprove of. So I'm wondering if it's something you've, you've worked to change in your organization. How do you mean? The, 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 the master, grandmaster bit? Yeah. Well, yeah, well, we just make sure people do the proper times. Uh, you know, that three and a half years to black belt and then the time periods between each belt. We don't, we don't let people jump grades or anything like that. Um, People who've got their grade, they've earned it. They've done the time. Uh, they've put back in. Uh, you know, we have a lot of professional instructors. Uh, you know, in fact, I was the first professional instructor in, in the UK doing Taekwondo. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it, 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 you know, we try to run a very professional organisation. You know, and 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 make it a benefit for the students and the instructors. I'd like you to. Tell us about a time when, when maybe life was challenging and how you were able to use or reflect on your martial arts for that. Yeah, well, uh, I've been divorced twice. I'm married for the third time. So those times were very challenging. Uh, and I used to find that when I went and taught, um, I was able to switch off, not worry about things like that. I was teaching all the time. I was running three schools. So I was teaching seven days a week. And also I had... Um, uh, my father died, my mother died, uh, sister-in-law, brother. So I've had a lot of um, bereavement and things like that. Uh, I've always found that I could um, call on the strength, really, from doing martial arts, really, and training and dedicating myself to that. Uh, and, and that's always helped me because I find that when I was teaching, I didn't think about anything else. I was just thinking about you know, teaching and getting the best out of the students, and, and, uh, and I found that helped me a lot. Do you have advice for people that maybe are are struggling and they're stepping into a school as a student and, and they have a harder time 
you know, leaving those troubles at the door? What, what might you tell them? Well, for me, they've just, again, they've just got, once they, they step into the, uh, the gym, they, they've got to just switch off and they've got to concentrate on what they're doing. Uh, I just think it gives them strength all round. If, they, if they're taken out of their environment that's really bothering them and they go there into the dojang, then, then you know, that they, they can forget everything. They can just train and dedicate themselves to that. Uh, and, I, and I think it's a little... I know that I'm, I've got a student now who's who's training who, um, who they really, not too long ago, lost their husband. Uh, it's a lady. And since she's been doing this taekwondo, it's given her a lot of strength. Uh, she threw herself into it, and uh, she's made a lot of new friends, and she's got a new hobby, and she gets to travel, and uh, she she just it's just helped so much. And, uh, and I've seen a lot of people who's helped in different ways with uh, when they've had problems. If you look back over your martial arts career, who has been the most influential person for you? Uh, my instructor, without a doubt. Uh, he, he was, he was, uh, his name was Bob Howe, Mr. Bob Howe. And he was the first person uh, to be graded the black belt in the UK by the ITF and Ricky R. Uh, he, he was the first one. And I was his first black belt. And uh, the school that I joined, it was his school, and he passed that over to me. Uh, and I took over because he went to work abroad. And he, he didn't want to teach anymore, um, but I'm still friends with him today. Um, I found him a very straightforward, honest person. He he, he always told you he had great integrity, and he still has, and I still see him to this day. And uh, he's very, very well respected, uh, and again, by all martial artists, not just Taekwondo people. Did he ever offer you any, any advice or, or any words that really stuck with you that you'd be willing to share? Uh, he didn't particularly advise me, but he always told me that, you know, you have to be honest with the students, be upfront, be straightforward with them, let them know, you know, that you're not a demigod, you know, you're just like they are, except, you know, you've trained a lot longer, you've got more experience in life than they have. And, and mainly to be honest with them and not to try and make out that you're something you're not. Uh, that, that I think is the best thing and I've always carried that forward and I like to think that all of my students would think that of me and in fact the people in my organisation and, and that ties in with what we were talking about earlier yeah, yeah exactly if you could train with anyone that you haven't anywhere in the world, anywhere in time who would that be? Uh, probably Benny Urquidez and uh, Ray McCallum Mm. And also uh, a boxer who I really like, and because I was, I'm still very interested in boxing, it would be Roberto Duran, because um, I'm a big boxing fan. I started to mention that when you should have been my hobbies. I'm yeah. a really big boxing fan. And what would you hope to learn from those gentlemen? Uh, just what drove them on, um, you know, because obviously they're all very competitive. Uh, you know, and uh, and what made them you know, the way they were, and and pushed on and pushed on, and I believe they still train now anyway. Um, um, and uh, I've seen lots of films and stuff with them, um, the DVDs and things, and uh, they always impressed me. We talked a little bit about competition and, and how it didn't go so well that time at, at a European yeah. tournament, yeah. and and you mentioned in there that competition was something that you enjoyed tell us about your time yeah. as a competitor well as a, when i was a competitor I, well, I won the british championships uh, and that was at a time when uh, there was no weight divisions and things like that and sparring equipment it was just uh, bare hands feet and uh, i also represented uh, great britain and for the team for several years which i really enjoyed and uh, and then i passed that on and then when when it came to uh, having our own organisation, when we uh, split from the ITF, we then started entering into open competitions, which we weren't allowed to do beforehand. Uh, and I found that um, very enlightening, very good. And um, we established ourselves as one of the best teams around. And uh, that's gone on from strength to strength. Um, when I was coach, we won the ITF World Championships in Argentina, 
We won the European Championships in Naples. And then, obviously, we split from the ITF in uh, 83 and formed our own organisation. Um, so competition's always been in my blood. And it, it still is. I, I, I find it's uh, the thing that I enjoy the most uh, about Taekwondo. Do you encourage or require your students to compete? No. No. Uh, I... <laughs> I used to, be, uh, I used to be very competitive and do a lot of competition training and things like that. But I, now I don't because martial arts has changed uh, from when I started uh, completely. I mean, there was no women training and there was no juniors children training. But now you have a lot of ladies training and a lot of juniors training. I do encourage the children to uh, take part in competition, but only if that's what they want to do. And there's no, you know, you've got to go in a competition or anything like that. We encourage them and um, we get quite a good response. Um, but it's, it's competition not for everyone. Some people don't like competition. They don't, you know, like being out there in the arena. So, uh, no, I don't try and make it there. But if we have squad training and things like that that they can go to. Um, we have a lot of competition. So if they want to do it, they, you know, they can go. I'll just say to them, you know, if you want to try it, try it. If if you don't, then, you know, some people just go and, and do the patterns, uh, which they enjoy, which is it's fine by me. Um, but I, I do still think it helps and it helps to build character when they compete. When you say martial arts has changed completely, you know, you, I think you're you're in a, a unique unique position for me to ask you this question because you've trained in multiple arts across a, a quite a length of time and, and across the world. Outside of women training and, and children training, how else has it changed? Well, again, I think the training has changed. So people have become more scientific now if you like there's a lot more um you know with the stretching and things like that from when i started uh so i dare say people are more informed and of course they've they've got the uh internet and all this kind of thing so it, it's a different but the, the the classes are different as well as especially over here um where people do contracts for training and this kind of thing so you know and there are obviously organisations that uh, are just only really interested in, uh, as you would say in America, chasing the dollar. So um, yeah, I, I think that's how it's changed. Whereas the people, when I started, just wanted to train and, and nothing else. That was it. And they dedicated themselves to it. People today are not dedicated. You know, they they like to do a, a class on the Monday and then go swimming on the Tuesday and play racquetball on a Wednesday. So. It's, it's not the same. It's become part of their life and not their life in the way. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. Like I said, I, 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 I would train seven days a week. And if I tell my students that, no, they, they go, seven days a week? So I'm not telling the truth. But I did train seven days a week. If I, if I wasn't in the in the school training, I trained on my own or I trained with the, one of the other guys who was in my class at the time. Um, and and I, all the way through, even as I got older, I was still training uh, at least three to four times uh, down the gym with other people who were uh, around me in my organization. So uh, uh, I've always enjoyed that part of it. What what part? I mean, what we have people of, of the physical you know, part. all style. OK, so it was. Imagine that you're you're talking to someone. I, I've I can certainly empathize with that. You know, I've I've trained pretty much my whole yeah, life, yeah. And, and I'm very passionate about martial arts. Hence the yeah. show. But we have some folks, yeah. I'm sure, listening that are new to martial arts, or maybe even considering martial arts. What is it about martial arts right. for you that you were so invested that you would train seven days a week? Because it's an individual thing that you can improve all the time. You know, uh, if you take some other classes, like aerobic classes or other kinds of classes, that kind of thing, you know, you, there's no improvement, there's no goal. For me, with, with, with much arts, you can always improve, you know, all the time. You can get better. And, and it's an individual thing. It's not a, a team game. Even if you go in a tournament and it's a team, it's still individually down to you for your performance. And, and that's what I found, uh, how I got ahead of it, is, is the fact that I could go and train on my own and then still enjoy it. And I always felt good at the end of it. 
and, and, and so I think that, that for me is, is, is the goal for people is uh, to improve themselves uh, physically, mentally, you know, emotionally. I, I think that's I think what gives people in martial arts uh, that edge, uh, and, I, and I think you see it against other sports at times. How about movies? Martial arts movies? Do they do they do anything for you? Do you enjoy watching no. them? No, I'm not a fan. No, <laughs> I, don't, okay. I don't watch them. <laughs> I don't. You know, I, you know I, obviously we all remember Bruce Lee and Into the Dragon, uh, but um, I, I'm not a big big fan of martial arts movies, no. Uh, and I think now, uh, in some respects, they've become a bit pointless because they can just mimic, you know, take the Matrix and things like that, you know. But they can just do it with uh, technology, Um so, uh, no, I'm, I'm not going to do this. If I, I go to the movies, I want to see an actor. And I don't want to see a, a martial artist being a second-rate actor. How about books? You mentioned earlier your your passion for karate books as oh. you were training in karate. Are there... Yeah, well, I read a lot of the, the, the old karate books, yeah. Uh, but normal books, I do like to... Uh, I like to read factual books. Um, I'm, my favorite book is Bravo to Zero. Um, about uh, SAS in uh, in Iraq. Uh, I also um, I, I like those kind of books. Um, it's um, my son was uh, in the forces for twenty two years in the Marines, um, and I got I went and watched them train quite a bit, and I got very interested in it. So I've read a lot of books um, about war zones and things like that. I, I find those very interesting. Are there any martial arts books that you might recommend to our listeners? Uh, I think The Art of War, probably, by Zeus. And um, uh, I also, The Five Rings, uh, which is a samurai uh, book, are, are quite good, I think. But, I mean, there are so many books out there. Like I said, you said to me earlier, and I said to you, Alex Gillis's book I'd recommend um, for people, if they do Taekwondo, to read. But, I mean, there are lots and lots of good books. Uh, karate books out there that, that they can read for sure and of course art of war and book of five rings I mean, those come up on the show all the time yeah, yeah. They're, they're classics yeah but yeah because you know the i, I think that um it, it gives you more a thing on the philosophy side of it so if you want to into that that, that that's what you know you look at those books they're very good let's talk about the future you know what you're still training you're, yeah. you're teaching uh, obviously, yeah. you have yeah. have the the admiration of quite a few people, which is why I we ended up speaking. What's keeping you motivated? Because I'm sure overseeing twenty five thousand students is not simple. No, uh, well, actually, the, the fact that of the organisation that we've built it up to to be what it is today, um, myself and the other seven guys who, who run the TAGB with me, and um, that motivates me and competitions that we still put on we um next year we put in on the, the world championships in in birmingham in july um so there's a lot of work has to go in that but i'm also chairman of the british taekwondo council which is the national governing body for taekwondo in in the uk so i do a lot of work there so i the thing with me is i like to keep busy i'm that kind of person i i want to I'd be bored if I wasn't working and doing stuff all the time and uh, getting the challenges and new things coming up and going into it. Um, that's, that's what I like. I, I don't like to be uh, just sitting on my laurels. I like to stay there and do as much as I can, but improve the organization and help people and help people to open new schools and help my own instructors as well, who, uh, who still, a lot of them still come and train with me, which I, uh, I really like. Um, because it shows that, you know, over the years, those people have stuck with me. Uh, and I think if there, there was a fifth tenant, a uh, sixth tenant, rather, I think it would be loyalty. Uh, and I'm a very loyal person. Um, and someone once wrote in a martial arts magazine about me, and they said if you cut Dave Oliver's head off, he'd have TAGB running right through his neck. And uh, I think I thought that was about the best compliment anybody could pay me. Clearly, you love what you do. You love martial arts. You love the yeah the impact that you've been able to have and sharing it with others that's wonderful yeah yeah i do i think yeah. that that's 
I think that's the goal for so many of us is to be able to share what we love with others, whether it's martial arts or not. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, when I see little children doing it and some of them have really high standard and I just think, God, oh, that's amazing. Uh, I've come there and, uh, Three of my own children are black belts, and, and uh, my wife's a black belt. I've got grandchildren now who are coming up to do it. So, yeah, it's, it's passed on. It's in, it's in, it's in my blood. Really, it's as simple as that. And uh, anybody, anybody who knows me will tell you that I'm passionate about uh, Taekwondo and, and all martial arts. You know, and I've met some great people over the years, uh, martial artists. And, uh, I'm, you know, some really good people. I know these straightforward people. If people want to get a hold of you or learn more about you or your organization, maybe they're in the UK and they want to find yeah. one of those, one of your yeah. member schools, how do they do that? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, the, the organization's, uh, website, which we run is, uh, it's T A G B dot biz. Okay, and uh, obviously we have a Facebook page. I have my own uh, website, which is tagbgmoliver.co.uk. And to reach me direct, I have an email which people can go straight to, which is orders at taekwondopromotions.co.uk. And that comes direct to me. Great. And listeners, no worries if you're driving or something and you don't have the opportunity to take notes. We'll have those over on the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, under Grandmaster okay. Oliver's episode. Okay. Well, I really appreciate okay. you being here. Thank you so much for your time. Might you offer us some some last words, some, some final advice for the people? Okay. Listening? Well, my final advice is, you know, uh, a black belt is only a white belt who never stopped training. Uh, uh, and I think that's that's the main thing. Sometimes people just pack up too early. You know, they they stop training Jeremy when they could have carried on. Uh, and uh, I, I think that's the goal: is that people should still train, keep going. And um, because as you get older, I think it's it's even better when you do martial arts because it's better for your health, better for you mentally, physically. Uh, I couldn't recommend it too highly. Uh, and, and that's what's made me. Uh, I, I, I owe everything to Taekwondo, not the other way around. When I think of the qualities that define leadership, for me, Grandmaster Oliver has them. All of them. The students in his organization are fortunate to have his guidance and experience, that's for sure. Thank you, Grandmaster Oliver, for coming on the show today. Over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find the show notes with photos and links to our guest and his organization. Find Whistlekick on social media. We're at Whistlekick on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and everywhere else you can pretty much think of. You can also check out the show's Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes. Find the newsletter sign up at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. And of course, our YouTube page, YouTube.com slash Whistlekick. That's it for now. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.